Hey guys, welcome to another video by the Financial Controller. My name is Phil Hanna and in this video I'd like to discuss another interview question that comes up in accounting and finance interviews and that is the Enron bankruptcy and the fallout that followed. And so we'll be going over the timeline of events as well as the accounting practices that Enron adopted and that led to its demise. The story begins with a merger that happened in 1985 between two companies, the uh, Houston Natural Gas Company uh, and Internorth Inc. Uh, and then that resulted in the formation of the combined entity Enron. Uh, the CEO of Houston Natural Gas at the time was uh, Ken Lay and he continued to become the CEO of the combined entity Enron. Then in 1990, Ken Lay, who was still the CEO, hired Jeff Skilling. Um, Jeff Skilling will become really important in the story later because he becomes the architect uh, of a, an accounting technique which we'll discuss um, mark to market. Jeff Skilling was at the time one of the partners at McKinsey and Company, uh, which was the consulting company advising Enron. In 1992, Jeff Skilling devised a new accounting technique called mark to market by which he can adjust the value of an asset on the balance sheet from its historical cost up to the fair market value and capture that difference um, as a gain or revenue. So basically this allowed him to, when he built the power plant, to look at the value of the power plant today when you built it and then look at its uh, future revenue and then adjust the value of the plant based on the cash flow that it's expected to generate, allowing him to capture the projected revenue from that plant as revenue today, which is crazy, but uh, believe it or not, this technique got approved by the SEC in 1992. The effect of using the mark-to-market technique has been incredible for revenue and for the stock performance in general. And so as you can see, the stock has gone um, from 1990 to the year 2000 from somewhere around $10 a share to somewhere around $85 a share. Also in the year 2000, Enron entered the deal with Blockbuster to provide a uh, service, a video on demand service. And so basically this partnership was gonna allow Blockbuster to streamline movies online. Uh, this was before Netflix uh, created the video on demand service and uh, Enron was gonna provide the broadband or the internet service uh, behind it. Then what Enron did is that took the profits from the contract that they expect to make in the future and booked it as revenue today in the year 2000, uh, obviously inflating revenue by a big margin. And so obviously this deal went nowhere because the technology wasn't there yet. And so this was the beginning uh, of the end for Enron because the performance of the business as far as the cash that's coming in wasn't matching up with the revenue that's being booked. But for investors, including retail and institutional investors, the stock was a no-brainer to invest in. Um, because of the mark-to-market practice that Enron did, um, revenue growth was incredible. So this is a stock that had amazing revenue growth um, and also the debt-to-equity ratio because you had such an amazing uh, revenue on your books, you're able to show tons of profit and that inflated your retain earnings um, and in the end your debt debt to equity ratio uh, was really appealing and as a result when you have these two factors uh, the stock price was going through the roof and so you really had to invest in that stock if you wanted to make money and because so many people and institutions and pension funds were invested in the stock the fallout of the bankruptcy of Enron in 2001 had such a huge effect on Wall Street uh, a lot of people lost their uh, pensions lost their retirement funds um, and it was just like a bad situation for many people in 2001, after Enron declared bankruptcy, obviously the stock went from 85 or $88 a share all the way down to about 50 cents uh, per share. Uh, and so, as you can imagine, Ken Lay and Jeff Skelling were arrested and prosecuted. Uh, basically, the prosecution lasted from 2001 all the way to 2006, during which in 2006, uh, Ken Lay died from a heart attack uh, as he was having health issues prior and I imagine the stress from the prosecution was pretty tough uh, and so he died while um, in custody and then Jeff Skilling was convicted and uh, sentenced to 12 years in jail. Jeff Skilling by the way just got out of jail in 2019 and surprisingly he's back in the business. He said that during his jail time he came up with a business plan for an energy software business and so it's amazing. I'm not sure how 
he's going to be able to get back into the business or if anyone is going to trust him. But that's, that's basically the news. Now, as far as who's accountable for this disaster at Enron, I think you have to think of two parties. One is management, which was Ken Lay and Jeff Skilling. And then two, you have to think of the auditors, which at the time was the firm Arthur Anderson. At the time, there were five big accounting firms, KPMG, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Ernst & Young, and Arthur Anderson. And because of this fiasco here at Enron, Arthur Anderson went out of business because many of the big public companies that were using Arthur Anderson for the audit engagements or advisory engagements um, let go of Arthur Anderson and um, hired another firm because the public trust was just eroded and nobody trusted Arthur Anderson anymore. And so it was a big uh, exodus of uh, partners and uh, staff from Arthur Anderson that went to work then later for the other became big four after uh, the dissolution of Arthur Anderson. The other big consequence of the fall of Enron was the enactment of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, also known as SOX 404. Basically, Sarbanes-Oxley states that every company has to have a framework of internal controls. The purpose of the internal controls is to uh, ensure the integrity of its financial statements and that management has to sign off on the integrity of the financial statements and on the effectiveness of its internal controls. Sarbanes-Oxley also states that the auditors who signs off on the financial statements of the company not only signs off on the financial statements, but also signs off on the effectiveness of the internal controls of the company. That's it for this video. If it adds any value to you, please give me a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and share this video with anyone who you think might benefit from it. And see you in the next one.